90-year-old Cardinal Joseph Zen, arrested by Chinese authorities and then released, is due back in court next week. What might be his fate, and where is the outrage from the Vatican? Plus, Pope Francis has more to say about the traditional Latin liturgy. Joining me on that and many other stories is editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal from Washington, D.C. Bob, uh, I want to start with the case of retired Hong Kong Cardinal Joseph Zen. Regular viewers of the show will be very familiar with the Cardinal and the constant message of freedom, both of religion and human rights and democracy, that he has echoed over many years. He was arrested last week by Chinese authorities for, quote, colluding with foreign entities. He is due back in court on May 24th. That is a day, incidentally, set aside by Pope Benedict to pray for the church in China. Where is this leading, Bob? Where do you see it leading? Well, it's an effort at intimidation. I mean, a 90-year-old cardinal, if you're terrified of that moral witness, it shows you that there's some power that is opposing something that feels itself to be uh, inauthentic, in, in a way. And look, look, this idea of this collaboration with foreign powers, this is as ridiculous as the Russia hoax during the Trump years. Um, th this was a human rights organization trying to promote democratic values and whatnot, which Hong Kong, at least in theory, uh, professes to follow. So, look, this, this is clearly pressure from the mainland. It sends a message to a lot of different people who might be willing to step forward and follow Cardinal Zen's lead. Uh, we could wish that something uh, would come out of the Vatican in support of him, but there seems to be just no will to do that. Mm. The chair of the USCCB Committee on International Justice and Peace had this to say on May 11th in response to Zen's arrest. We'll put it up. The Vatican's press office said Wednesday, the Holy See has learned with concern the news of Cardinal Zen's arrest and is following the evolution of the situation with extreme attention. I join with the Holy See in expressing concern for the fate of Cardinal Zen and others who share his current predicament. I invite all those of goodwill to pray for their safety and that justice may prevail. That's Bishop David Malloy, who's a chairman of that committee. Now, uh, Bob, the Holy See and the USCCB statements really couldn't be more noncommittal. Everybody's watching this situation with extreme attention. I don't know why they have to tell us they're watching it with extreme attention, but th this seems to miss the point. Where is the prophetic outrage or condemnation? I mean, even Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi defended Zen as a critical voice of conscience and condemned China's failure to live up to the terms of the Hong Kong transfer. What should the Vatican, and certainly the USCCB, be saying? Well, I, I think that, that religious bodies are in the business of truth-telling and of supporting uh, moral values, uh, moral virtues, if we want to put it that way. And this is not simply some sort of, you know, border skirmish between two countries. This is a direct mm -hmm. attack on, uh, first of all, a major church figure, but also by proxy, a, a, a whole set of values that we in the West and, and the church in, in, the, in the world over the last several decades has championed as well. The church has been one of the great champions of democracy in Latin America, in Europe. Um, and, but there's, they, they seem to, to want to dance around this, this question of China, mm -hmm. when China will not listen. Uh, it's, it's clear that the Chinese are very hardcore. They see the, this sort of, of almost cringing approach to the, 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 uh, the issue, and they will not be moved, nor will they be stopped. It's important mm. to, not, to recognize that it's, it won't stop here unless someone uh, puts some pressure on them to make them stop. And I, I think that is a yeah. primary uh, function of the church at this moment about China. Mm. Bob, it is remarkable that uh, in the United States we just sent another $40 billion to Ukraine in the name of protecting democracy, yet democracy is being taken and has been being taken day after day, week by week, from the Chinese and the people of Hong Kong, and no one in the government issues any complaint, and now even the church is silent. Look, a day after that USCCB statement I read earlier, the Vatican Secretary of State had this to say to journalists regarding the Zen situation. He said, quote, My most concrete hope is that initiatives like this cannot complicate the already complex and not simple path of dialogue between the Holy See and the church in China. 
That's Cardinal Pietro Parolin. Uh, Bob, the, the secret Vatican-China deal just won't go away. As backdrop, it should be noted that two top Vatican diplomatic officials were withdrawn without replacement from Hong Kong and Taiwan earlier this year. There seems to be more concern at the Vatican over this still unknown political deal. The details are unknown. We know there's a deal. Uh, but they seem to be more concerned about that deal with the Chinese communist regime than they are about one of their own prelates, uh, to say nothing of the Chinese faithful. Yeah, you know, we keep referring to that agreement between the Vatican and China as a secret agreement. I mean, it certainly is yep. something that we, we don't know even the, the, the barest outline of what it, it allows and it doesn't allow. There seem to be some rules, although we, we're not exactly clear on those, about the appointment of bishops. But look, this is, this is a matter of uh, a direct um, conflict between two different visions of the world. One in which a totalitarian state, a communist state, and we've had enough experience with these type of states now over the last 70 years, 70, 80 years. Um, it's, a direct, it's, it's a direct clash between a communist vision of the world and a Christian view of the world in which human beings are free, they have dignity that has been given them by God, not by their, their governments. And it, the, mm -hmm. it's as, precisely at these points that the voice of the church is extremely important in defending what can be still defended in Western values. To me, I'm just, I'm just mystified by this. I've said this before on the show. I don't understand what the, the church or the West gained from this so-called secret agreement, but we see what the Chinese have, have gained, and they're taking advantage of it every way that they possibly yeah. can. Well, Cardinal Zen, um, before he was arrested, uh, on this show and elsewhere, said this was a sellout of the Chinese church by agreeing to these terms. And he had seen some version of this and had been uh, informed about some of the details of this agreement. But obviously, there were powers both in the Vatican and in the Chinese government that wanted him shut up and continue to want him shut up. Bob, uh, I want to get your take on this. Just this week at his Wednesday audience, reflecting on the book of Job, Pope Francis said that protesting to God in the face of suffering and injustice is a form of prayer. God is not afraid of our prayer of protest, the Pope said. Now, now, Bob, if protest is prayer or can be, why not more protest when it comes to Cardinal Zen and the opposition of the church in China by this regime? Even a determined global prayer initiative, we hear nothing. Yeah, I think that was an unfortunate choice of terms. I, I, what he meant, obviously, was that, you know, asking God why. And I mean, all of us do this at some point. You know, mm -hmm. a child gets sick or someone dies or there's a terrible circumstance. And, you know, we protest, God, why are you, in, in a sense, we protest, God, why are you allowing this to happen? But it, it, mm -hmm. it almost, by using that term, it almost gives you this kind of almost political um, sense of what, what he's trying to get at. And yes, if, if we're going to protest to God himself about things that we think are going wrong, I mean, these, these, these horrible regimes, as, such as we see in China, that have a, a, a track record of their own, and the ideology has a, a, a very, very dark track, track record. Look, in the 20th century, I did a whole book on martyrs, 20th, 20th century yes, martyrs. Yes, you did. In the, in the 20th century, China, uh, communist regimes killed 100 million people. Probably 40 million mm. of those were, were in China. So it's, it was, it's not hard to see where these, these regimes go, and you have to stand up to them. You, and the way that the church stands up is by its moral witness. It's not going to send in troops. It, it's not a question of how many divisions does the pope have. It's a question of right. how human beings respond to moral principle, and they do. And, and if you, you help to strengthen the backbone of people who have to resist, whether it's in Hong Kong or whether it's in Taiwan or in our own West, then that is a, a role that the, the church can carry out that probably no other institution can. Well, and we saw it, look, we've seen it in action in our own lifetimes with a man we knew, uh, Karol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II. He summoned both the religious as well as the moral fiber of the people of, of, of Poland and destroyed the, the, the Russian regime without ever raising a, a gun or a cannon. It fell by moral suasion, backed by the, the deep tradition and the beliefs that he was on the right side of the angels. 
And you see that kind of rhetoric being employed vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, but nothing when it comes to the Chinese, because China remains a trading partner and somebody who, uh, you know, a, a market very important to American interests. The idea that they're going to lift tariffs on China, Bob, should fill every American with mortal dread. And the fact that both Republicans and Democrats are supporting that, 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 that they should raise their voices and howl at their representatives. Uh, Bob, even the U.S. Congressional Executive Commission on China attributes the rise in religious persecution there to that Vatican-China deal. They say it's gotten worse. Why are we so unwilling to even speak about this or address the reality of what's happening there? And why is the Vatican silent on organ harvesting and enslavement of peoples for religious identity and illegal arrest of clergy. Uh, I hate to say this, but it, it, this is a, a pattern that often has occurred in the church where people feel that they placed a bet on a, a, on a certain path, and then mm. they're reluctant to have to back off from it because it makes it look like somebody, you know, it's not just mistakes were made in the abstract, but somebody made a decision that has led to a disaster. And, and I think that uh, we're going to see this get much worse. Uh, our, the current, current occupant of the White House has got his own um, compromises when it comes to China, as we well know, also with, with regard to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the Holy See under Pope Francis has been very reluctant to call out regimes. I mean, we've seen this in the case of Russia as well. It's as clear as anybody could possibly want it to be that Russia has committed an aggression against another sovereign nation. And yet, mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, the Holy Father has been unwilling to specify that it is Russia that ha has has uh, taken the, these unjust steps in that war. So, look, there, there's... Well, Bob, at least... Yeah, at least he's confronted Kirill and said, you know, you're in danger of becoming Putin's altar boy here. And, uh, you know, he, I, I think, has been a heck of a lot more vocal about Ukraine than he has about his own suffering people in China, and now one of his cardinals. Yeah. Well, I guess that's true. But I, I, even the, the, the engagement with Kirill, I don't see that there's much to be gained there. That, you know, frankly, Kirill mm -hmm. has long been compromised, as you and I know quite well, uh, going back to KGB days. And... Uh, why you why you treat him as a authentic dialogue partner on a religious plane? It just seems to me to not correspond to the the truth of the situation. He's a, mm -hmm. he's basically a a member of the the governing body of of Russia. Um, he is much less an independent religious person with whom he can enter into dialogue. And, Bob, just a note for our audience who, you know, may be tuning in for the first time, even longtime viewers, uh, to give you an idea of what clergy are facing in China. Bishop Zhao Zhumin has been arrested seven times over the last two years. Bishop Zhang, another uh, prominent member of the underground church, that means the church in China loyal to the Pope and Rome, he's been missing. And now Cardinal Zen is arrested. What the Chinese have essentially done is decapitated the bishops and cardinals who were loyal to Rome. And they have replaced them with the Vatican's blessing with nothing but party apparatchiks. And that's the reality. That's the reality. And, Bob, as you're aware, uh, Jimmy Lai was given an honorary degree recently at Catholic University. How important is it uh, to honor uh, and keep attention on the injustices being committed by China, particularly where, when Lai is still incarcerated? Well, I think it's uh, fundamentally important that we keep these people in our memories and in our prayers because, look, look this situation did not go away. What tends to happen, as we know, given the, the news cycle these days, is somebody's arrested, and a week later, everybody says, oh, yeah, we already know about that, and they right. forget about it. Meanwhile, someone may be sitting in prison, they may be tortured, they, they may be under psychological pressures, and this, this is typical of the type of regime you see in a place like China, and we can't let them get away with this. So I'm very proud of the Catholic University of America right here in Washington, D.C., for being brave enough to bring up that case again and, and remind people once again, and we need more, much more of this going on in all yeah. sorts of places uh, in, in the free world, to remind people that in our world today, in our postmodern, you know, we think liberated, woke world, there's a great deal of real repression, not the fan fantastic op uh, oppression people think that they're suffering in a place like the United mm -hmm. States, but real oppression in a classic sense of people being thrown into jail, being intimidated, mm -hmm. facing, 
you know, who knows how many years in prison, disappearances. This is a, a very sad story that was played out all too often in the 20th century, and we shouldn't allow it to happen again in the 21st. Bob, before we move on, Roe v. Wade very likely could be overturned uh, over the next few weeks here in the United States, uh, should the Supreme Court rule in that direction. It looks like that's where they're tending. What do you make of the relative silence from the Vatican on uh, really one of the cornerstones of, of the faith, which is uh, a commitment to life? Well, if it's a relative silence, I would even be happy. I, I don't know that there's been a word spoken. Maybe there has been, and I just haven't seen ab about this case. And, you know, you hear excuses that the, the, the people don't want to pro provoke an anti-Catholic backlash, and there is anti-Catholicism in, in the United States that would be exploited, of course. But look, the Vatican and other religious bodies, including our bishops, have no trouble at all speaking out in political terms about climate change, about refugees, and, you know, all sorts of other subjects, the poor. This is the, 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 the unborn are the poorest of the poor and the most slaughtered category of people on the face of the earth today. Not to even mention that you hope that the, the Supreme Court will do the right thing in seeking to pr pr uh, protect life at all stages. This just seems to me to, to have d uh, diminished the moral uh, witness of the church in, in ways that will have repercussions mm -hmm. in the future. The other things, the, you know, the, the refugees and the, the climate, et cetera, those are debatable policy questions. This is a fundamental respect for human life. And if you can't speak out about that, just as if you can't speak out about religious liberty when these questions come up, then what are you in business for? Hmm. I want to move on to Pope Francis's recent comments before we run out of time on the liturgy, the traditional Latin liturgy. Uh, it has become a favorite subject of the Holy Father. Here's what he said uh, just last week. I still emphasize that liturgical life and the study of it must lead to greater ecclesial unity, not division. When liturgical life is a bit of a banner of division, there is the smell of the devil in there, the deceiver. It is not possible to worship God and at the same time make the liturgy a battlefield for questions that are not essential. Bob, the Pope seems to be convinced that the traditional Latin Mass and the community surrounding it uh, cause division tripling down on the assertions of his guardians of the tradition that uh, encyclically wrote. Your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, I, I, rather. Yeah, I, I really find this inappropriate. I mean, I want, to, I want to say that frankly, because, look, even at their worst, and people do write me and call me and tell me about, the, the, you know, they've encountered somebody who's, who, who disputes the validity of the current mass, and I understand that there are people like that. Of course there are. But there are a tiny minority of the people who are interested in the traditional Latin mass. And even when they are, are somewhat... Um, extreme, or if you want to put it this way, divisive. At least they're they're hearkening back to something that that is truly Catholic. We see a lot of other movements in the contemporary world of of real schism. I mean, we mentioned Germany in in, in past shows, for example, and there mm. doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency about these radical departures from all sorts of things that the Church has believed for two thousand years. So. I find him, I mean, it, it seems to me that there's a straw man here, and he's attacking not simply people who, with great reverence and feeling that it, it nourishes their spiritual life, want to continue with that traditional Latin form of the Mass. He's attacking people. He's saying that these people are divisive. I don't believe that that, that by and large, is true. And I have, to, I have to say, because I don't think he's meeting with a lot of people who are divisive, I think people are feeding him that story, and it's a false story. Mm -hmm. Hmm. The Vatican's financial fraud trial uh, continues in Rome this week, Bob. We've been watching this for years now. On Wednesday, Cardinal Angelo Beshu testified on Wednesday that it was Pope Francis who ordered the ousting of Auditor General Libero Milone. Now, uh, as well as that cancellation of the Price Waterhouse internal audit, according to Beshu, I have no responsibility concerning the resignation of Dr. Milone. I merely followed an order received by the Holy Father that was taken in full autonomy without any involvement. Bob, originally it was Beishu who was accused of firing Maloney, but the firing came after they discovered that Maloney had hired a firm to spy on clerics who might be engaged in corruption. Now, I thought everybody wanted full transparency. Now we learn the Pope demanded 
that Maloney be fired. Your take on this. Well, you know, there are some people who are, whose judgment I trust about this who say that this trial will never really resolve uh, the problem. And I, I think that there's, there's reason to believe that, but I'm hopeful that that's not the case. Look, I have to think, as with, with the, the question of the Latin mass uh, people, that somebody has to be advising the pope about this. He's got many, many responsibilities. I doubt that he's mm -hmm. going over you know, real estate transactions and prices and, and, and exchanges and whatnot. Someone told him that, that, that uh, Milone had to be fired because he was, he was doing something outside of the bounds. It seems to me that if he mm. began to investigate mm. and thought he could not trust people within the Vatican to carry out an impartial investigation, he probably was onto something. I don't think that this was just some kind of fishing expedition on his part. I think he sincerely right. knew that something was out there. The problem with this is that we've had this now, this assertion by Betchu. I don't think that the Holy Father will, can be called as a witness in a, in a Vatican trial. No. I don't think that he can even publicly um, make a statement contradicting what Betchu has said. And we know that he stripped Betchu of his cardinal uh, pr prerogatives because he had lost confidence in Betchu. So we've got this statement. It may be true. It may not be true. Ultimately, it probably is true that the Pope made that decision. But after what preliminaries that were probably right. guided by Betchu and others in the Vatican? Well, this was similar to your commentary about the Latin Mass, the Pope's perspective on the Latin Mass and the community. He's being given this information by people. And in this case, you may have people who were involved in this probe and were subject, targeted, by the investigators. So it was in their interest to kill the investigation and certainly any outside probing eyes. And they successfully did that. Now, speaking of rule changes, very quickly, I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, Jesuit father Tom Reese wrote a column this week imploring Pope Francis to change the rules of papal elections to prevent a, quote, deadlocked conclave. According to Reese, innovations by John Paul II and Benedict XVI that intended to prevent a long conclave actually thwarted compromise among the cardinals. Reese's solution? To return to the traditional two-thirds vote of the cardinals to elect a pope. Bob, your thoughts on this. Does this suggestion have any merit? I want to see the evidence. What, what, what deadlocked uh, conclaves have, have we seen? The election of Benedict was re relatively quick. The election of Francis was relatively quick. I mean, if we were talking in the history of the church, I mean, there have been times when conclaves have gone on for weeks and months, and not, you know, not when, the, when right. the citizens of Rome have stormed the Vatican and told the cardinals elect somebody already. So that would be deadlock. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of the person proposing this and of the proposal. I think that it's worked reasonably well to, to up until now, and until we see that there is a problem of some sort. Um, I would stick with a tried and true. It's, it gives you good popes and it gives you bad popes, but at least it's, it's something that we, we have a certain confidence in. We don't know what a, a different um, a, approach might produce. Well, Bob, I, I was delighted to see that Father Reese had discovered innovations that he didn't like in the church, but I'll leave it there. For commentary, <laughs> you can visit Robert Royal at CatholicThing, thecatholicthing.org.